The respiratory system has one major task, and that is to facilitate gas exchange. To be more specific, oxygen and carbon dioxide. However, in acute respiratory failure, this function is limited or completely non-functional. Do know that there are two types of acute respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure and hypercapnic respiratory failure. Hello everyone, my name is Don and today we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of hypoxemic respiratory failure. This is also known as oxygenation failure. Normally, oxygen is inhaled, goes to the alveoli, and diffuses within the pulmonary blood vessels. But in hypoxemic respiratory failure, this is simply compromised. Hypoxemic respiratory failure is defined as a partial pressure of oxygen or PaO2 of less than 60 millimeters of mercury despite the fact that we are giving the patient at least 60% of fraction of inspired oxygen or FiO2. Again, a PaO2 of less than 60 millimeters of mercury despite an FiO2 of at least 60%. Now, there are four major physiologic events in hypoxemic respiratory failure. They are ventilation perfusion mismatch, shunting, diffusion limitation, and alveolar hypoventilation. First up, ventilation perfusion mismatch. This is also known as the VQ mismatch. V refers to ventilation, and it is the amount of gas that reaches the alveoli, and it is in the section right here. Q, on the other hand, refers to perfusion, and it is the amount of blood perfusing the lungs. It is pretty much the blood vessels within the lungs, as represented by the picture right here. Theoretically, the amount of gas that reaches the alveoli is equal to the volume of blood that is perfusing the lungs. Meaning, for every 4 ml of air going in the alveoli, there is also approximately 4 ml of blood that is ready to receive the oxygen. We can also write it as a fraction or ratio so that we will have a VQ ratio of 1. Now that is our magic number. If we will have a result other than 1, then we have a ventilation perfusion mismatch. Now there are numerous conditions that usually cause a VQ mismatch, such as pneumonia, asthma, COPD, and pain. Let's say pneumonia. Pneumonia will cause these secretions to pool within the alveoli. This will then result to a decrease in the amount of oxygen going inside the alveoli. However, the amount of blood perfusing the lungs remains unchanged. Going back to the ratio, since there are limitations in the amount of air going in the lungs, let's change the V to 1 ml, while the Q remains the same. This will eventually give us a ratio of less than 1 meaning a ventilation problem such as pneumonia will give us a low VQ mismatch. But this is different from perfusion problems. You see, in perfusion problems, the amount of gas going inside the alveoli is not affected. The problem lies within the blood vessels in the lungs. There is not enough blood perfusing the lungs, meaning not enough blood will receive the oxygen. This can be caused by pulmonary embolism and a decreased cardiac output. Going back to the ratio, since we have perfusion problems, let us change the Q to 1 ml, while the V remains unchanged. This will give us a ratio of 4, which is more than 1. So, in general, a perfusion problem will cause a high VQ mismatch. Another physiologic event in hypoxemic respiratory failure is shunting. Now think about shunting as a VQ mismatch, but an exaggerated VQ mismatch. You see, there is no gas exchange that is happening in shunting. The blood exits the heart without participating in gas exchange. And this can be caused by conditions such as acute respiratory distress syndrome, and septal defects of the heart. 
Other physiologic events of hypoxemic respiratory failure are diffusion limitation and alveolar hypoventilation. Now, diffusion limitation happens when the alveolar membranes thicken or get destroyed. There is gas exchange, however, as the name implies, it is limited. A classic sign for diffusion limitation is hypoxemia that occurs during exercise but goes away at rest. Alveolar hypoventilation is actually a mechanism of hypercapnic respiratory failure. This is included in hypoxemic respiratory failure because this condition will eventually lead to hypoxemia. So let's get right to it. We're going to talk about the pathophysiology of the hypercapnic respiratory failure. To understand the pathophysiology, there are two concepts that we have to understand. The ventilatory supply and the ventilatory demand. So first, let's talk about the ventilatory supply. This is the maximum ventilation that a body can sustain without developing respiratory muscle fatigue. Second, the ventilatory demand. This is the amount of ventilation needed to keep the PCO2 within normal limits. Let's put those two together. Normally, the respiratory supply is always greater than the respiratory demand. To put it on perspective, we breathe about 16 to 20 breaths per minute at rest. During exercise, this increases to about 40 to 50 breaths per minute. Even with that sudden increase, the supply is still always greater than the demand. This simply means that under normal condition, even with rapid respiration, we still won't go beyond the supply. The problem occurs when we have obstructive disease such as COPD or bronchitis. Because of the obstruction, there is less CO2 that is exhaled outside of the body. The body then breathes double time in an attempt to release the excess CO2. The increase in respiration is so great that eventually the respiratory demand exceeds respiratory supply. Exceeding the respiratory supply causes the respiratory muscles to fatigue, which eventually will lead to respiratory failure. Respiratory failure can be acute or chronic. Acute is sudden and can be a life-threatening emergency. An example of this is a child with asthma who suddenly is experiencing bronchospasm. Chronic is tolerated better because changes in PaO2 or PaCO2 is gradual. This allows ample time for the kidneys to compensate in the changes in arterial pH. Manifestations of respiratory failure varies according to the onset and whether it is acute or chronic. Regardless, the earliest signs of respiratory failure are a change in mental status, tachycardia, tachypnea, and mild hypertension. The patient could become restless, confused, or agitated. This is because our brain is sensitive to variations in oxygenation. Also, when a person is experiencing respiratory failure, that person will have high catecholamine level as the body tries to compensate for low oxygen level. That's why that person will have increased heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. The specific manifestations of hypoxic respiratory failure has an acronym percent, while for hypercapnia, we have PMRT. Percent, paradoxical breathing, retraction, cyanosis, expiration prolonged, nasal flaring, and tachypnea, PMRT. Firstly, breathing, morning headache, rapid and shallow breathing, and tripod positioning. In hypoxia, the patient has prolonged expiration because the body is trying to excrete excess carbon dioxide. As you may have noticed, the chest and abdomen expand as the patient exhales. This is not normal, and this is called paradoxical breathing. So when the patient inhales, the chest and abdomen relax. This is due to too much use of accessory muscles. You may also notice retractions. This is when the muscles between ribs pull inward, again, from too much use of accessory muscles. 
You may also see nasal flaring and increased respiratory rate as the body tries to get as much oxygen as it can. The late sign of respiratory failure is cyanosis. This is when the patient turns blue and it occurs when the PaO2 is less than or equal to 45 mm of mercury. In hypercapnia, the patient is usually in tripod position, sitting upright and leaning forward. This position decreases the work of breathing as it increases the anterior posterior diameter of the chest. The patient may also experience morning headaches because at night we tend to have lower respiratory rate. This allows accumulation of carbon dioxide. Since this is a vasodilator, it increases cerebral blood flow and intracranial pressure, which manifests as a headache. The patient may have rapid shallow breathing in an attempt to get oxygen and blow off carbon dioxide. This is not effective. It is better for the patient to do pursely breathing because this method will prevent alveoli from collapsing, improving the patient's ventilation. Here are the ways that could help us diagnose respiratory failure. Physical assessment is very important because we see early signs prior to changes in ABGs. Of course, ABGs will allow us to determine the patient's oxygenation and ventilation status. Pulse ox is also good for measuring oxygenation status. Chest x-ray, CBC, serum electrolytes, urinalysis, and culture can help us identify the cause and what might be the consequence of this condition. EKG of course for monitoring the heart, VQ scan and CD scan to rule out pulmonary embolism, and tidal CO2 to assess lung ventilation. Pulmonary function test is also an option, but not routinely done. Hemodynamics. CVP will tell us the status of tissue perfusion. PAP and PAWP will tell us if the accumulation of fluid originates from the lungs or the heart. PAP for lungs, PAWP for heart. Implications for respiratory failure. The implications are divided into three assessment, diagnosis, and interventions. Since Natalia has already gone over with the manifestations, we'll go over some diagnostic tests for respiratory failure. Of course, everything starts with vital signs. Oxygen saturation will probably be low. ABGs will be drawn and it will show respiratory acidosis, which is low pH and high CO2. Pulmonary function tests may show decreased pulmonary function, chest x-rays are done, sputum cultures may be obtained if an infection is suspected, and there are your hemodynamics, CVP, PAP, PAWP, and LAP to check blood pressure in the lungs. Now all these will depend on what's causing respiratory failure. With the data gathered from your assessment, there are three main NANDAs you can use for respiratory failure. The diagnosis really depends on the underlying cause. There is impaired gas exchange, ineffective airway clearance, and ineffective breathing pattern. Next is the interventions for respiratory failure. To simplify, nursing interventions are divided into three ways, physical, chemical, and supportive. Increase your patient's head of bed at least 45 degrees in order to help expand the lungs. If your patient has secretions, you can also position them laterally. Just remember the concept, good lung down. This allows for postural drainage and prevents aspiration. If you do need to suction your patient, make sure you hyperventilate in between suctions. Suction for only 10 seconds with a total of 15 seconds including the insertion of the catheter. When suctioning, make sure to watch for increased intracranial pressure and dyspnea. You would also anticipate a chest tube placement. If the patient has a pneumothorax, they would be placed superiorly and anteriorly. If your patient has pleural effusion, they would also be placed inferiorly and posteriorly. So we've talked about the physical implications of respiratory failure. Next, we're going to go to chemical implications. First one is oxygen and device is going to be depending on how much oxygen your patient's going to need. For example, nasal cannula can only give 1 to 4 liters of oxygen. Then you move up to simple face mask or venturi mask. Just remember, for oxygen therapy, there's also complications such as oxygen toxicity, especially for COPD patients. Bronchodilators may also be given in order to dilate the airways of the lungs. Mucolytics help liquefy the secretions. Others include corticosteroids, diuretics to help them pee out the fluid, antibiotics for infection, pain management, and also anxiolytics. So we've spoken about the physical and chemical interventions. Next, we'll go to supportive. 
You're also going to hydrate your patients in order to help thin out the mucus. So normally, it's going to be 2 to 3 liters per day through mouth or through IV. Hydration is contraindicated though with patients that have heart failure or pulmonary edema. At this time, if you are giving hydration, you would watch for fluid overload such as crackles, dyspnea, and increased CVP. Your patients are going to be at risk for aspiration, so you're probably going to give them nutrition through tube feedings or parenteral nutrition. Have them consult a dietitian. Just know that they're going to need high calories due to hypermetabolism. You're also going to monitor your patient's hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is responsible for oxygen transport to the tissues from the lungs. Without hemoglobin, oxygen will not be able to reach the tissues. You may also help your patient cough. There's also chest physiotherapy, usually indicated if sputum is greater than 30 ml per day. Other supportive therapy include usage of incentive spirometry, bed rest, and early ambulation. So that's the nursing implications for respiratory failure.